Bienvenido. Welcome back to the Latina Athlete Podcast. But before we get started, please subscribe, please follow, please download our app, please share. Today, I am very excited. We have a very special guest. Uh, this guy played for some of the biggest programs in NCAA and played overseas and played in the NBA G League. I'm very excited and very happy to welcome you, John Horford. Oh, thank you for having me. So uh, how you been? How's it going? I know it's a, it's a crazy time, uh, but h- how are you guys doing on your end? Uh, we're good, man. We're good. Just fortunate that, uh, you know, I grown in the family is, you know, healthy and safe. So uh, can't ask for more than that right now. You know, so we definitely want to start from the beginning. You know, if you can, you know, let us know about a little bit about your background. Um, so I'm from Michigan, played high school basketball in Michigan, went and played uh, undergrad at the University of Michigan. Then I did my grad year, my fifth year at the University of Florida. Um, after that, I went and played in the I played in the G League for four years. Um, <clears throat> so I guess right after that, technically, I went to uh, I went to a training camp with Milwaukee Bucks. Then I went to the G League. Then um, yeah, I mean, for basketball wise, that's that's pretty much it. I played in the uh, Dominican the the Dominican League for a little bit. Um, Played in Belgium for a little bit, and I mean that's that's been it, playing wise, basketball wise. Talk about John as a kid. Uh, talk about you know what got you started in basketball. Oh, man, it was kind of forced on me, you know, because everybody, uh, everybody in my family plays. But uh, I remember my mom telling me when I was like in sixth grade, she's like, "If you want to go to college, she's like, you better get a scholarship." So I was like, "Man, you know, I, I gotta get a scholarship." <laughs> So, so that was my goal. I was like, you know, my goal is to, you know, to play for a play for a college, you know. So, uh, so I went out and did, man. Just just started training consistently, and um, you know, was fortunate enough to eventually, you know, earn that scholarship and, and get an opportunity to play. Um, you know, outside of playing, I also have a, I have my app. That's like a, it's like a training app, uh, Blueprint Athletes. We do. Um, you know, basketball training and strength conditioning. And it's really, um, you know, starting to pick up in the last couple of years, growing, the following's growing and um, the engagement's growing and the subscribers are growing. So it's uh, it's good, man. It's good to stay, stay busy and stay involved. And it gives me an opportunity to help, you know, kids to develop, uh, you know, in ways that a lot of kids don't, they don't understand the process growing up and how you develop. And, you know, a lot of kids just think, oh yeah, my goal is to play, you know, division one basketball or any level you know of college basketball and they think that they can kind of just get there you know but there's a lot that goes into getting to that to that point and you know my my goal is to you know help as many kids with that journey as possible so john um you tell me about it tell me about your father because since we know your father is dominican and and you are dominican so you was born and raised in Michigan, but your blood drains out Dominican Republic everywhere. So, your father was the first Dominican basketball player in the NBA, period. Yeah. Can you tell me about your father that you keep until now? So, what he teach you about basketball and about life? Um... I would say the the main lesson I the main lesson I got from him is that you need to work hard and um, something he always used to tell us when we were kids was that you know he was he played mostly off just his natural talent and athleticism and you know he's tall and strong and fast and um, he didn't really work that hard so he would always say you know make sure you work hard make sure you work hard he's like I, you know I didn't I didn't work as hard as I should have and you know he kind of wishes that he would have worked harder so. That was the main thing that I, I always took from him. And the step that you take to to be part of, of Milwaukee Bucks, uh, the few days that you that you have in, in that team, your father told you that he used to play for that team for the first time in the NBA. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I knew we had. That was a long time before. That was yeah, like, I know. Like, That's a long time. <laughs> like 30, 30 years before. 30 years before he did. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I knew. I mean, I, I knew that's where he had played and all that. And, um, yeah, he, he he made that clear. And, um, you know, he had a lot – I think the practice facility, when I was there, they were building the new one. So we were still in the old practice facility too. So it was the same practice facility that they used back then. They had, they had like, made some uh, upgrades, but the building was the same. How was the process that, you know, these universities approached you, approached your – your family approached your your high school, and 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 what was the the final determination for you to pick uh, University of Michigan over every other school? So I started getting recruited. I would say actually seriously, like you start getting the letters. Like I started getting letters like my freshman year. The letters the letters don't really mean that much. Um, I, I think it's like when you start. Um, and I don't even remember what the rule was when you could visit. But I remember because I used to go to like a Michigan State games all the time. Um, so they give you like tickets. They say you could come to the game, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I would say sophomore year probably started getting recruited a little bit more seriously. Um, you know, uh, talking to coaches when you were able to and uh, going to games, going to events, then just going to open gyms. I used to go and play uh, pickup with the uh, Michigan state basketball players when I was in high school. Um, you know, that was always, that was always pretty fun. And then I would go to, I went to some other colleges and, and played pickup, um, went to Michigan and played pickup. I went to like Dayton and played pickup, just places that I could like drive to, you know, that weren't like super far away. Um, and then ultimately, I mean, they, for the most part, they were contacting me through my AU coach. I played for an AU program. Uh, the Mustangs at the time, you know, it was like the, the biggest AU program in Michigan. Um, my brother, a bunch of, you know, really good players have gone through that program. So the guy who runs that, Norm Odin, he, he knows all the college coaches. So they would, if they have interest in you, they would contact Norm. Norm would let you know. Um, and that's how they did it for the most part with me. Or um, or they would, they would have, uh, they would contact, you know, my dad or uh, – or someone around me essentially to get a hold of me. Sometimes they went through my college or my high school coach, but not very often. And I actually found out after um, after I committed to Michigan, he was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you, but you know this school and this school and this school and this school." And I was just like, Man, "Whatever." <laughs> wow, well, you're so not gonna you tell me that. The coach was holding <laughs> out. Your coach, your high school coach. I was like, "Dude, you're not gonna tell me," but no, he didn't tell me. Um, yeah, and then I ended up choosing the University of Michigan just because. At the time, the reasoning probably wasn't the best. I wanted to play. I like the Big Ten. I wanted to be kind of close to home. And the University of Michigan is just such a, a great academic school. And if you ever go to the campus, it's one of the most beautiful campuses in, um, you know, in the country. Like, beautiful campus, great restaurants, great atmosphere. You know, if you like food and, you know, going out, like, it's a lot of fun. So that, that was one of the main reasons why. You got a chance to play in the Final Four. Yeah. How was that? It was good, man. It was good. We um, we had uh, we were going that year. We were going for a, we actually didn't win anything officially that year. It was a really good year, but um, we uh, we almost we almost won the Big Ten championship for our second year in a row, and then we ended up winning it the next year after. But uh, we almost won our Big Ten championship. We fell short of that, and we thought we had a really good team and. Uh, uh, and we had a tough road to get to the final four if, or to, to even the championship game. If you look at it, we had a tough road to get there, but uh, it was, uh, it was good, man. It was, it was a great team, great experience. Uh, some, some great memories. I was actually just talking to one of my teammates before I got on here, uh, Spike, the the kid who uh, he, he dropped 17 in the first half when Trey Bird got in foul trouble in the championship game. But uh, yeah, some, some fun memories. So, so, so why, you know, every, it seems like everything was, was going pretty well for the program, uh, for the team, um, but you decided to transfer uh, to another school. Uh, can you talk about that process? Because from, from my understanding, you know, with the transferring, you have to sit a year, you may not sit a year. Uh, uh, you know, can we understand a little bit better of, you know, why you decided to transfer? How's the process of you submitting for a transfer? And finally, to getting to to Florida and playing playing at Florida. 
So the rule with the transfer is that you, at least it was at the time, I think they changed it, but um, you had to transfer to a, a grad a grad program that wasn't offered at your university. So that was like the rule. So you had to graduate and then you had to go get into a program that wasn't like offered specifically at Michigan. So that was the process of it. But I mean, announcing that you were going to transfer, I mean, it's, it's really not that difficult and the school ends up doing most of like the paperwork and stuff for you. Like, you know, I announced I was going to transfer and I didn't even, I didn't even reach out to any schools, you know, uh, school started reaching out to me as soon as I announced, you know, so I was fortunate and, um, uh, you know, I had some, I had some options, some really good options, but, um, I ended up choosing to go to the university of Florida. And the reason I chose to go to the university of Florida is just because, um, uh, Billy Donovan just, he sold me and I thought that it would be the toughest. I want to put myself in the toughest situation possible. I wanted to, put myself in a situation where I knew I would be very uncomfortable um, in a place where I almost didn't even want to go. Like I never wanted to really go to Florida until I started thinking about it and like, see, see how you react when you're put into a situation that you never wanted to be in. So I, I kind of threw myself into that for that reason. Um, and it ended up being a very uh, interesting year, right? A very interesting year for growth. Can you tell me about the year that you came up here to the Dominican Republic, 2015? You played for San Francisco, Los Indios. Mm -hmm. What bring you here? And what's, why do you leave so early? Because what I know, you just play like uh, seven games. Yeah, it wasn't a lot. And then the second time I came, I played like less games maybe even than that. But um The people, the people in San Francisco were, you know, they were very nice, very professional. Um, I went out there because I was, I was going out there between going to um, getting out of college and going to uh, summer league. So then I ended up leaving early because the uh, team I was playing summer league with asked if I would come in early and start doing workouts. Yeah. So then I, I went in a couple weeks early. Um, went did workouts with them for like two or three weeks and then we went to Las Vegas for summer league so um, that was the reason why I left early from uh, San Francisco. How do you look basketball uh, about that time in, here in the Dominican Republic? How do you find it? So different? Um, a little different a little different um, the coaching style was a little different the playing was a little different To be honest, what bothered me the most about the Dominican Republic and was uh, whoever was keeping the stats. They were driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I got every single game tape, and I would write it down, mark it, and I'd send it into all, you guys got to change this. You guys are crazy. I grabbed like 16 rebounds. They'd be like eight rebounds. It was like, you guys are, you guys are nuts. I, I, I literally have the video. I'd be like, watch, look at the video. And they'd be like, no, nah, I can't do anything about it. They told me that. Like, can't do anything about it. I was like, you guys are crazy. For a player that may not get that opportunity to go straight into the NBA and needs to play international, what are some tips that you tell this person to protect themselves and what they should watch out for and how can they research these uh, international leagues? I would say the best thing you could do is um, – You know, the basketball community is somewhat small. Like, find someone who's played on the team or in the league that you're trying to play for or played for the coach that you're trying to play for. Find out what type of person they are. Find out, um, you know, how the team is with, you know, paying guys. Like, that's, what I, that's what I hear the most, um, you know. Uh, it, it's just guys not getting paid. Like, you know, I have – I have a I have a friend that I actually met when I was playing in the Dominican League the second time. Um, he was playing in Israel, and he uh, he got like first team all league, did a great job this year, and they didn't give him all his money. Like they didn't pay him. Like they didn't pay him his money, and he he had a great year. They didn't have a reason not to, except that they didn't. Like you know, the league ended early, but um, a lot of those contracts are guaranteed. So, um, but it's a super, super common. Like I even have friends that, you know, um, you know, played in the NBA and went overseas and they were messing with their money too. Um, 
So just making sure that you're in a situation, like if they're messing with your money early on, more than likely that's going to be a, a continual thing. Like it's always going to be like that. Um, as far as, you know, playing and putting yourself in the right position to, to have success. I mean, like always, you know, especially on the professional levels, it's this way on every level, but you can get away with it more when you're young. Um, you know, not necessarily knowing your role and doing your role to the best of your ability, but when you get to the professional level, you know, you have to know what your role is and then you have to go and, you know, do that role to the best of your ability, right? And not everybody can, you know, not everybody can get 20 shots a game, right? Not everybody has the, the ball in their hands the whole time. Like, you know, you could be defender, rebounder, um, you know, strictly a facilitator, uh, whatever it may be, you have to know your role and do it to the best of your ability. Um, I would say that's a mentality you have to have. Like, there's nothing wrong with working on your skills and, you know, aspiring for more. But, you know, typically once the season starts, I mean, you, you pretty much know which roles you're going to be in. And, you know, if that does change, the coaches will, you know, let you know that, you know, your role has changed and, and then you can, you know, act accordingly. But trying to do too much has gotten a lot of guys I've played with in trouble. Like, you know, they come in and they think, oh, you know, even though the coach told me my role is this, I'm going to go in and jack every single shot. If, mm -hmm. if someone's not, if they're, they don't have two hands in my face, like I'm, I'm throwing it up. And those dudes almost always get cut, almost always. So um, you just know your role, play your role to the best of your ability. And, uh, careful with agents man i personally i haven't had great experience with agents but um maybe there are some good ones out there i i haven't really worked with any that I, i'm like you know man that's a really great he's just a great agent um um at least with me personally uh so i, I would be careful with with the agents because they can they can rope you into some some strange contracts right that's the other thing like any anytime you get a contract I know a lot of younger players, especially, don't necessarily have the money to, you know, get their get like contracts written up and you know get their own contracts written up. But if you could just find someone who knows law or knows contracts to to go over your contracts and make sure you're not signing up for anything crazy, because um, people will try to get you on contracts too. It's it's wild, man. I've seen it all. No, I'm, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I mean we hear some some awful stories of agents taking advantage of these players not only in basketball but also uh, in baseball, right? You know, obviously we all know that Dominican Republic is a hotbed for 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 baseball players, and you have a lot of these representative these you know bucones, quote unquote, you know, taking advantage of these kids uh, because of the lack of education and access, right? So I'm glad you, I'm glad you touched on that. Um, we had Alex Mirabel here uh, in the previous episode on the show, who's a head coach here in New Jersey for St. Peter's Prep and also was the coach for the 70U National Dominican team. One of the things that came up during our, during our conversation was what happened or the news that just came out with the NCAA paying college athletes. We'd love to get as as a as an ex big time you know D one the Big Ten program you know what do you think about um, college or the NCA allowing athletes to monetize their likeliness and their image? I think that allowing players to monetize their likeness and their image is a smart compromise um, on behalf of the NCAA. There's not enough money to pay players because then you'd have to start cutting sports programs and deciding, you know, which sports get paid, which ones don't. And the majority of programs, even on the D1 level, don't make money, right? It's a small number of programs. And football is the big money maker. Basketball is not even the, you know, big money maker for most universities. So having the ability to go out and make money off your likeness yourself, you know, gives players an opportunity to make money without, you know, schools having to pay that money directly to the players, right? And deciding who gets money, who doesn't. Under Title IX, women would probably have to get paid too, obviously. And, um, you know, and even though the women's game is a great game, it's lo it loses money. Like, it, it's not making money anywhere except for probably UConn.
I mean, and that and that's that's probably the truth. I mean, there, there's just not a lot of programs because even in men's, you know, college basketball, not a lot of programs make money, um, you know, overall. So, yeah, he he also mentioned that you know now that you know the door seems like it's opening for a lot of these uh, these athletes to be able to make money. Um, you know, he believes that in the near future it will trickle down to the high school grammar level, grammar school level. Uh, do you foresee that? Do you foresee that in, you know, five, 10 years, uh, you know, AU players like yourself, when you was in high school, you played for an AU program, uh, mm -hmm. that these kids will, will, will earn uh, income or will make money at a high school level? I mean, there are definitely, there are definitely high school players who could monetize their, um, their likeness and make money off it right now. If they're not already making money off it right now, um, you see a couple of them, like the Ball family had, they, you know, the Ball family had their TV show and their, their product brand or, you know, Big Baller brand. And then, um, you know, there's some other high school kids right now with like shows on like Snapchat or YouTube or whatever. And um, I mean, there, there's an opportunity for those types of players to make money. Um, it, it just, it'll come down to the NCAA allowing it. Cause I mean, technically I don't, I think as long as you're not getting paid to play, you know, you could still make money um, off of like a business venture. I, I believe that's, that's the case. Cause I mean, the high school kid could get a job and make money and then still play in college. Yeah. So, I mean, if acting was the job or them recording your life or following you around, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it, um, I don't see any reason why those kids, if there's an audience for it, which there is, um, I don't see why they couldn't make money off that. So I have a question. This, this is a, a different one because you have a, a system, a program that you're going to help young kids around the United States. But taking, taking you as a Dominican, how can you help Dominican ballplayers to go out to the United States in your system? My uh, system, you mean the app? Yeah, your app. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and I do help, and I, and I do, uh, you know, work with some, some people from the Dominican Republic through the app, and some people, South America, um, Australia, Europe, um, Asia, you know, there are actually people all over the world, like, using it right now, and, um, I just help them to see training differently. You know, most kids just want to get to, you know, looking really cool and doing all the fancy moves. And my focus is, you know, the same focus that a lot of my college coaches had, especially John Beeline, and that's to build up the fundamentals and help kids to understand the game and to, you know, understand how to impact the game, you know, in multiple ways. So that's, it's like an education process with these kids and, you know, and I'd be happy to, you know, help out any kids that reach out. Like I, I talk to between like 10 and 30 kids a day, you know, just on social media, just about their game and, you know, how they should go about training. But the app itself, just all, all kids have to do is follow the videos, you know? So yeah. even if a kid put in read English, Right. All you have to do, they're all in order. You just follow the videos in order and you just, you know, do what the video shows you to do. And the videos are short, very short. It just shows you exactly what you're supposed to do. And, um, all right. you know, there's been some there's been some really good results. Like, you know, I have a few kids that I work with, um, you know, and through the app that are, you know, going, going to play college basketball and have improved a lot. And, and I tell kids all the time, you don't have to even have a goal of playing college basketball. Like just wanting to be better at basketball, you know. So you can, you know, have fun with your friends or, you know, uh, you know, make the team for the first time ever. Like, that's a good reason, too. This uh, postcard is, is a little bit English and Spanish. So how do you use Spanish? Horrible. <laughs> horrible. 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 Man, you're Dominican. I know, I know. They, 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 here's, a, here's, a, here's what happened. Here's what happened. So uh, when... My cousin, my cousin and my aunt, um, they're Dominican. Yeah. And they came to live with us when we were little kids. Um, but they, they didn't know English. 
So they had to learn English. So only English, only English, only English. Al came over, didn't speak English. So only English, only English, only right. English. No one, ever, no one ever taught us Spanish, ever. <laughs> so me and my younger siblings, uh, there's four of us. None of us know Spanish. And how was it in that, in that year, in 2015, playing for the Indians? How do you manage to speak English and, and Spanish? How was it? Because you told me your, your Spanish is horrible. <laughs> it was horrible, but no, it wasn't horrible. The, the, the guys on the team, they almost all spoke, uh, most of them spoke English, a little bit of English. It was good. It was good, man. We had fun. And uh, my guy, uh, Machi, up there, he, he took care of us, man. He, uh, he drove us around. He took us to all the food spots. He, he, tra he would translate. So... Uh, very exciting conversation here with, with, with John Hofford, you know, learning about his background, learning about his experience playing uh, not only in the U.S., uh, but also in the international game, the Caribbean game, per what I said, the Caribbean game. I don't even know what I called it. I don't know if that, that exists, but the Caribbean game, it's in the Caribbean. It's the Caribbean game. It's the Caribbean game. Which is, which is, I mean, this is different. Um, there's definitely some, some exciting stuff for that. But I, I, want, I want you to touch – you know, a, a little bit about your experience in the G League, right? You played for multiple teams, a couple of teams. You know, how was that experience? And also how difficult it is for a G League player to get called up uh, to the NBA? What's that connection with the NBA team and their G League affiliate? Um. I mean, I, I enjoyed, you know, playing playing in the G League. I, I thought that, you know, the competition was good. Um, you know, I, I got to play for some for some good coaches, some really good coaches. And, um, I mean, overall, I, I thought it was a, a really good experience. And as far as, like, the connection between the teams and, um, like, the, the farm teams and then the NBA teams, it's uh, – it's getting closer to being like a, a minor league baseball type system. So it's almost like, like G League would be like AAA, but you only have a certain number of people who are affiliated with the team. So you're going to have like the two ways and then beyond the two ways who are, you know, NBA and G League contracts where they go back and forth sometimes. Um, you're going to have a couple of affiliates on the team. There's, I think there's two to three maybe. So like five max and maybe it's four max on the team that could only go up to the professional team. So like when I was just in Grand Rapids the last two years before this, um, you, the affiliates could only go up to the Pistons, but anyone else on the team could get called up to any other team. Right. So that's, um, that's kind of how that worked. And, so it's uh, something, it's something what designated where every team has two to four positions that they can, uh, I guess give them give them a title of two way or affiliate. That's how it works. Where only only those folks in those four or five contracts or positions are able to actually move up to play in the NBA. No, no, no. Anyone can move up to play in the NBA, okay. but they have to go up to the team that you're affiliated with. So we're affiliated. With, we were affiliated with the Pistons when I was with them. So you'd have to go up. Uh, and play for the Pistons. If you're, um, you know, an affiliate player or a two-way player. Um, so when I was in Can, that team would have been the Cavaliers. So anyone who was in that position would have had to go up and play with the Cavaliers. Um, but everyone else can be called up by any team. So the Cavs, the Jazz, the Trailblazers, whoever. More and more players were, will skip college and go straight to this new program that the G League uh, implemented this year. Um, I think that it's going to benefit a very small amount of players, and I think most of the players that go through it are are going to struggle in the sense that they're all expecting to, you know, make it to the NBA. You know, statistics just say that the majority of them will not. And um, the other thing that they're missing out is that college experience, right? Um, they're going to have to, like, you know, do some of the college stuff because when you're in the G League, you know, you're, you're living on your own. A lot of times you have to do, like, your own shopping, um, you know, clean up after yourself, all that type of stuff. But just from an educational standpoint, I feel like a lot of kids, it's, it's going to be a disservice to a lot of kids um, because, you know, there's a lot of life after 
playing. So, you know, taking care of your money, surrounding yourself with the right people, um, you know, educating yourself and finding out what your interests are outside of, you know, playing basketball. So when you're done playing, you're not, you know, just lost. Like a lot of people are, you know, when they retire from playing, they're just, that was their whole identity. They didn't know anything else. Or, you know, a lot of players who get taken advantage of and they just think the money's endless. Like, um, you know, CJ McCollum made that comment about how he, he thought that if the NBA didn't get the money right with the contracts, that 60% of the NBA would be struggling. That's kind of crazy. 60%. I mean, I think the minimum in the NBA is at least a half. A, it's more than half. I know it's more than half a million minimum. And that's like the minimum contract. It's more than half a million. It's probably like around like 600, 700,000. Like that's the least paid player in the NBA. And you're saying you're going to be struggling if you don't get the next paycheck. That's kind of crazy. But that's a lot of people living in a way that, you know, is beyond their means. And I mean, you give – six seven hundred thousand dollars a year to you know someone who's financially literate and understands money a little bit that's plenty of money you can have a good you can go on two vacations you can go on multiple vacations a year you could have a nice house you could have a nice car you could eat well like you could do a lot of good things but you, you can't be crazy but you could you could have a lot of good things um especially, so if, I, it, I especially if you live in uh if you live in detroit with that kind of income dude I'm telling you, you come to Michigan, <laughs> you, you can get something nice. You can get a nice house, like a really nice house, you know, for for one in New York, you'd get like a cardboard box. Right? <laughs> well, and I, I lived in a few cardboard boxes here in New York, so I completely understand. I get it. At, at what point, at what stage, whether it was in college or whether it was in the uh, G League, did you start thinking of, life after basketball right because this is this is this is great this is amazing because a lot of young kids think okay if I make it to the NBA I'll be rich forever I will be secure forever yeah. and we all know that's not true we all know we all have seen the stories of uh, NBA players um, professional football players baseball players who make a lot of money but yet go broke um, at what point did you start preparing yourself for life after uh, basketball? And what steps did you take to be where you're at today? Um, I've, I've always thought about it, um, you know, because I've never really thought of myself as like, you know, John Horford is, you know, a basketball player. I'm, I'm like, I'm John Horford. And I, one of the things I do is play basketball. So, my identity, uh, it's never been completely tied to basketball in that way. But, I mean, just some of the, the small things that I did was, you know, just, um, you know, educate myself on, you know, saving money. And, um, you know, I have a you know, financial advisor, um, you know, investing money. Uh, and, and you don't even need a lot of money to start, right? A lot of kids think, like, oh, you know, you, you can't start, you can't start doing that until you're rich, rich. Like, that's not true at all. Like, you could start with a few, you could start with a few hundred dollars, right? You could start with fifty dollars a, a month, like if you want to start up slow and and start saving or investing and you know planning for your future. And um, but just talking to people, there are a lot of people out there, you know. And, and the important part is finding someone that you trust. You know, I'm fortunate fortunate enough, like a lot of the people I came up with are in positions like that. So, um, you know, and, and a lot of people get in trouble, like, you know, with, you know, just giving their money off to their family, like, oh, yeah, my homeboy said, you know, he's going to take care of this or, you know, my parents. And, you know, a lot of times they mean well, but they just don't know how to like handle that stuff. So um, just and not only trusting like the professionals, right, which is what everyone should do, right? Uh, if you're not a professional at that, like managing money, investing, something like that, you should talk to somebody who is, but you always have to stay involved with your money. Like, don't just hand off your money and just be like, whatever. Like, you, you have to stay active, right? You have to understand what's going on. You have to understand where it's going. Like, you have to be an active participant in all of that, right? And if you're not, then you make it easier for people to take advantage of you and to take a little bit here, a little bit there. And then, you know, sometimes that little bit turns into everything. 
like you've seen in in the cases of a lot of a lot of athletes a lot of athletes i mean even you know even people with like huge sums of money like um you know the people who got uh, ripped off by like bernie madoff right i mean a lot of famous people were in there a lot of you know well-to-do people and they just they trusted the dude and you know they lost every, some of them lost everything they lost so much you know because of that so staying involved in that process and and not being able to if you don't understand something or something feels weird to you speak up say something a lot of a lot of people oh you know i'm not gonna i, I trust i trust you know like i said say something say something and if they're weird about you saying something you asking a question that's a red flag that's yes. a red flag because that's their job to educate you on that right and to help you out right you're their client they're working with you um it, there's nothing wrong with asking questions right so if, if it feels weird figure it out ask questions and if they're weird about you asking questions find someone else find someone else iterate that a little bit um because i think our community lacks financial uh, literacy uh financial information many of us don't know how to save money um we weren't taught in school um how to save money which i think it should be part of the curriculum when you're in a grade school or you're in high school, I think, you know, uh, financial literacy should definitely be taught at a very young age and it's not being taught. So a lot of these athletes who, you know, are super talented are, many of them are, are God gifting, you know, may not have the, the, the education or the discipline to be able to protect themselves once they come into money, which is the case in, in many examples. So I'm glad you reiterated that. So if you're listening and you're getting approached by financial advisors from lawyers or whoever that are selling you a dream, and we say in, in Dominican, vendiendo un sueño, si te dan vendiendo un sueño, it's too good to be true. You know, make sure you ask a lot of questions. And if, if they act funny to the questions you ask, then that's a sign. That's a signal. Because their job and their responsibility is to educate you and protect you. So if they're, if they're acting funny with any questions that you may ask financial or legally, just know that their, their job is, is to protect you. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad you talked on that because, you know, there are so many cases and so many examples of, of players that are getting taken advantage, not only by agents, but by lawyers, you know, by family members, you know, they're getting taken advantage by so many uh, third party people that, you know, if they don't protect themselves or they don't have that education, you know, they're, they're in a tough spot. So, you know, thank you yeah. uh, for sharing that. I think that's, that's, that's really important. Yeah. Basketball doesn't define you, John Harford, you know, you're John Harford that happens to play basketball, which is, which is very well put, very well put. Um, so, what is your day to day? What are you working on now? Are you trying to get back in into the league? Um, you know, what's your main focus now, and what is your your goal for the next uh, next few years? Next few years. So my main focus now is um, we're releasing a new version of the app, like much, much, much improved version of the app that should be coming out very soon. Um, that's my main focus business wise uh, right now is just getting that out and just improving the overall user experience with that. And, um, you know, I'm, I've been holding back a ton of marketing material, um, you know, just for our launch. Uh, another thing I'm doing is I, uh, I'm, I'm launching a podcast with the release of my uh, new version of the Blueprint Athletes app, and it's the Blueprint Athletes podcast. I have 12 episodes recorded already. Um, you know, we're just waiting for the launch of the app to, to launch that. So working on that. And then I'm rehabbing my shoulder. I tore my labrum. Um, I, that's why I didn't play this last season. Uh, I was dealing with this injury. And, um, you know, I had a couple opportunities to go and play, but I decided that I just wasn't ready because I, I decided not to get surgery. So I've just been uh, working on the flexibility and the, and the strength and, uh, and rehabbing this and, you know, just seeing, you know, what opportunities there are, you know, basketball wise going forward, you know, I'd still love to play. Um, you know, I mean, I'm in my twenties still. And, uh, you know, I, I think I have a, a, at least a few more years in me. And, uh, 
so I'll keep going at that. And so just between working out and, you know, working on the app and uh, the podcast and, and all that, that's, that's pretty much what takes up most of my time. Do you see yourself in the future like uh, a, a coach in the high school, in the prep, or, or college? Um, potentially, my if I was going to coach, I, I think I'd like to coach maybe high school. Um, you know, I, I just feel like there's more uh, freedom to like run things the way that you would like to run things. Um, you know, college, I don't like the idea of recruiting kids. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, college coaches sell kids a dream and, you know, a lot of times they mean well, but, you know, they end up lying a lot to, to, to get the kids that they want to get. And then the pro game, um, you know, it's, it's players first, but it, it would just be tough because I, I have a, I don't have a lot of uh, patience for, you know, players who are, uh, you know, like lazy, don't want to work, uh, uh, all that type of stuff, you know, and you have to be respectful of that and, you know, find ways to navigate that because, you know, especially like on the NBA levels, there's no coach whose job is like 100% secure. Um, so I, I, coaching is definitely, it's something that I think about, but at the same time, I feel like I get a lot of coaching with, uh, with the app and I get to talk to a lot of kids from, you know, kids and coaches sure. from all over the world and, you know, college coaches, college coaches hit me up all the time, uh, you know, about <laughs> workouts and stuff for their players and, you know, I help them with that and, and I'm happy with doing that stuff and I have freedom, you know, me and my wife, we travel a lot, you know, we're, we're fortunate. So we, you know, we're, we're going all over and, you know, we're having a lot of fun and um, I, I kind of like living life this way, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I guess we have, you know, we play this, this game, this, this lightning round game where we'll give you two options and whichever one comes first, whichever you pick, you know, you, you pick one of the two. You down, you down to do it? Yep, yep, yep. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. It's 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 a. It, I mean, there's there's a lot of noise going on. The the last dance, the new documentary that's that's on ESPN. Everyone's talking about the last dance. Michael Jordan, you know. So I want to start with that, right? Respect to that time. Jordan Pippen, Shaq Kobe. Uh, Shaq Kobe. Jordan, LeBron, greatest of all time. Greatest of all time, Will Chamberlain. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, the big man is talking now. Okay, the big man is talking now. Okay, so let me let me let me, let me give you this: Alajuan, Jabbar, Jabbar, Nike, Adidas, Nike, Michigan, Florida, Michigan, Rodman, Draymond Green, Rodman. Lakers all time, Bulls all time. Lakers all time. Kyrie Irving, Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Trey Young, Allen Iverson. <sighs> Trey Young. Oh, the young boy. The young boy. Okay. Okay. He's Looking special, for the future. Man. Looking for the future. <laughs> he's special. He's special. But Allen Iverson's obviously special too, you know. I mean, he's one of the all time greats. Uh, a couple more questions, man. This, this has been uh, this has been great. It's been amazing. You played in DR. Um, what does Dominican Republic need to do uh, to become a powerhouse in basketball? Uh, um, player development, man. So player development and just uh, keeping good people around the players to keep their minds right. I feel like I feel like a lot of people in the DR like they're trying to you know raise up the ladder themselves, so they'll take advantage of a lot of people versus really just trying to like build up the next generation. But with the right type of development system and and people buying in, I mean the Dominican Republic. There's no reason why the Dominican Republic couldn't be a a serious serious basketball like powerhouse. And, and not that it's not on its way there, but there's no reason why it could in the next uh, ten years. No reason. Who do you see coming up that you that you say, okay, this this Dominican player has an opportunity, has a chance. This Dominican player is special. 
I mean, Carl's still young, man. Carl's so young. He, he's he's the type of guy who could be, you know, the MVP of the league, you know, and a really good dude. Um, you know, obviously super sad, you know, what happened with his his mom. Um, you know, really great supportive family and uh I, I mean, but the sky's the limit for for Carl. I mean, he could he could do whatever he wants basketball wise. Like I said, I mean, he really is one of those players who who could potentially be like a, an MVP of the NBA someday. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's it's a uh, very sad uh, when I learned of 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 her passing. I, I met her a few times. I'm 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 in Jersey and met her in Piscataway, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, my son plays travel baseball, so the 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 academy that he plays, um, you know, calls mom and dad. They have like a small academy for for basketball players. So we were run into them, you know. So when I heard the news, man, it was it was extremely sad. So you know, I I pray for for him. Um, condolences to his family. You know, I hope that you know when he comes back. It's I mean, there's there's no words to say, right? Like when when we do come back, when the league does start, we don't know where he will be mentally. Um, I mean, his pops is great. I think his pops is will, will definitely, and his family provide that support that he would he would be fine. Hopefully, when he comes back, but he is that you know that special number one draft pick, you know Kentucky. You know he definitely has all the assets, all the skills to become an MVP player. You know, obviously, you know situation, the city. There's so much that that that's involved in a player being successful, as you know. It's just not. I mean, my opinion, I, I don't know, and, and I hope, you know, you can provide some feedback around that. It's not just the talent, right? Yeah, it's definitely possible. But like you said, it, it's definitely more than just the, the skill level. I mean, because from a, from a skill standpoint, from a statistical standpoint, um, I mean, he puts up numbers that have, if you look at past years, have been considered like MVP type numbers, but it has to be, you know, on the right team, in the right situation, you know, you have to you have to win games. You have to have you know that great impact. And I mean, he's he's so young, and that's why I say him. I mean, he's he's still in his like early early mid twenties. Um, how old is he right now, Carl? What is he like twenty four, twenty three, like that? Like yeah, no, he still, he got some. He's he's still he's still uh, compared to me. He's still pretty young. You know, he still <laughs> has another you know ten twelve years. So he's he can still develop and become better and. You know, we hope, obviously, you know, for the best. Let everyone know um, how they can reach you, where they can go, uh, download your app, um, you know, the name of the app, your contact information. What's the best, the best way to connect with you? The best way to connect with me is to message me on Instagram. It's blueprint.athletes. Um, it should pop up once you type in blueprint. Uh, message me right I, I always get back to my messages within like 24 hours on there um 48 at the most if we have like a ton of messages but um yeah download the app um the link is in the bio on instagram but it's also just if you go to the app store or the google play store and type in blueprint athletes you can download the app it's just literally structured workouts that i wrote down over the years of playing college basketball pro basketball you know, I always like working out was always my favorite part of it. So I would just write down workouts like crazy. And I just took, you know, the best stuff and just structured it um, in ways that, you know, I know will help players to develop and to train and to, you know, grow progressively. Right. So, yeah. But if anyone ever wants to reach out, talk about their game or whatever it may be, um, you can always message me on, uh, on Instagram. Great. Last question. Who inspires you? Uh, who inspires me? Who inspires me? I, I would say my wife inspires me, man. She's a, she's a, a beautiful woman, man. She, she works really hard and she kills it in, uh, in her business. She has an app and she has a, a huge social media following and she, uh, she does an amazing job, man. Let me do this in Spanish, right? Right. So, eh, mira, estamos más que contentos, tú mismo lo acabaste de decir, eh, yo siendo parte de dominicano, eh, habiendo nacido en Michigan, estudiado en Michigan, ha tenido grandes eh, partes de, de su vida en lo que es el baloncesto, y claro, como mencionaste, como hemos, hemos mencionado, 
Su papá fue el primer dominicano en jugar en la NBA y eso fue quizás parte de su motivación porque toda su familia jugó baloncesto. Y claro, lo que él no tocó, lo que no le tocamos, lo que no le dijimos es que su padre está en el salón de la fama del deporte dominicano, siendo Tito Holford una de las estrellas más importantes del país en el baloncesto. Pero qué bien que él ha tocado muchos temas muy importantes, porque así mismo como hemos tocado con Alex Mirabel, eh, el hecho de, de, de jugadores que han venido de, de, de Dominicana a Estados Unidos a tratar de estudiar y moverse a otra, a otra universidad o escuela, el tema de él es diferente porque él, él, él estaba allá, entonces él estaba hablando sobre casos de jugadores que tengan cuidado con lo, con lo que son lo, lo, los manejadores, lo que manejan los contratos, esos contratos hacia otros países, no solamente aquí venir a jugar Dominicana, sino esos países que van hacia, Estado, hacia Europa, México, todos esos lados, porque encuentran muchas personas que le pueden hacer daño o pueden hacer un contrato o un mal contrato que pueda perjudicar al jugador. We wish you the best. I know we, we, we talk offline uh, many, many times. And, you know, what I mentioned to you earlier, uh, this platform is to celebrate, educate, and inspire uh, the youth uh, with a the, with, with the focus on uh, Latino athletes here who are in many sports and in many cases are underrepresented. Um, so we want to create this platform to, you know, celebrate folks like you who have been able to achieve what the majority 90% of the people 90% of the kids cannot achieve um, and like I gotta always say if there is one thing a nugget that they can take from this interview that they can use as motivation to help them reach their ultimate goal in life then we have done our job um, I am I am humbled I'm excited I'm happy that you joined us today um, you provided so much information Uh, I know there's there's tons of of, of content here that someone uh, will be able to to achieve. Um, and if they're in Dominican Republic, we're going to try to tr uh, translate it, put some subtitles, so we can motivate them as well. No worry, we, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, man, you guys, you guys are doing a great thing, man. So yeah, keep it up, man. Make, making the making the Dominican proud. Absolutely, man. So thank you so much, John, and we'll talk to you uh, very soon. Have a good night. Okay. All right, you guys. Take See care. Bye. Bye. See you.